Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll, uh, I think we'll get started. There's uh, usually a few latecomers, and we'll let them drift in, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll try and get underway now. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Downey, um, De Deputy Director and Fellow on the uh, Africa Program here at CSIS, and thanks for being with us today. Um, talking about uh, this, the referendum forthcoming in, in Sudan. Just one month to go now um, uh, before the people of southern Sudan get the chance to determine the future course of their country, uh, whether to remain part of Sudan or to separate and, and form a new nation. Uh, the decision uh, they make, of course, has the potential to redraw the map of uh, Africa and break up the largest country in the continent. Um, but perhaps even more important than the choice itself on, on January the 9th is the way in which it's made and the manner in which the referendum is, is conducted. Will the process fairly reflect the will of the people? Uh, because, of course, the answer to that question will determine how the government in the north will respond and how the government in the north responds uh, will help decide the, the future course of Sudan, whether it will tip back into violence, uh, even civil war, or whether it can finally cast off its history and, and truly consolidate the peace agreement signed back in 2005. Uh, it's for many of these reasons, no doubt, that uh, State Department officials speaking earlier this week described the referendum in Sudan as arguably the most compelling story that the world will face in the first half of 2011. So I think for once the hyperbole perhaps is, is justified here. Um, the international community is deeply invested in helping Sudan through this process in, in a timely and a, and a credible manner. But of course the challenges are enormous. Uh, not only the logistical hurdles of, of holding such a complex vote in one of the world's least developed regions, but of course the political risks of, of what's, uh, what could happen uh, if the process doesn't run smoothly. And not to mention the fact, of course, that uh, the separate referendum in Abyei is, is clearly not going to proceed on, on January the 9th. Uh, will the deadlock over Abyei derail the entire process? Well, our panelists this morning are all invested in this process in, in different ways. They've all uh, recently come back from Sudan, uh, and so they're well-placed to give us an up-to-date assessment on, on where things stand and what remains to be done in the next 30 days. Um, very glad this morning to be co-hosting this event with the National Democratic Institute, uh, an organization that's playing uh, a lead role in providing technical assistance to the referendum training uh, and also conducting some fascinating research into the views of Southerners in the run-up to the vote. You might have seen their report outside as you came in. Um, so we welcome Tracy Cook on my, on my far right, uh, NDI's resident director in Southern Sudan. Uh, delighted also to have with us Atul Kare, who's the uh, UN Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations. So in that role, overseeing all uh, UN peacekeeping operations worldwide, but for obvious reasons, uh, keeping a, a close eye on uh, UNMIS and uh, the UN missions in Sudan right now, and has just come back from the region. Uh, finally, on my immediate right, uh, we're joined, very pleased to have Linda Bishai from United States Institute of Peace, uh, where she's a senior program officer in the Academy for International Conflict Management uh, and Peacekeeping, and a longtime expert on, on Sudan as well. So, uh, great panel, uh, glad, glad you can all be with us. I'll ask uh, Tracy to kick things off for us uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I know we're always hearing doomsday scenarios out of Sudan, so I actually thought I would start this morning with a bit of good news. Um, and that is that technically the voter registration process has actually been quite good. Um, particularly when you compare it to the elections, the April elections uh, and the registration for that. Um, during that time, particularly in the South, there were registration centers that did not open for, from three to six days until after the process had started. Um, and many were missing critical materials uh, at important points throughout that process. And much of that was repeated, again, particularly in the South, during the polling period where for the first two days, I think uh, it was reported that up to 50% of the polling stations did not open on time. Um, in contrast, what's happened for the voter registration process for the referendum is that the vast majority of, in almost all registration centers, uh, opened on time and they also had the criti critical materials they needed to actually register uh, people. 
Thus far, both the Carter Center uh, International Observation Team, as well as the Sudanese Network for Democratic Elections, Sunday, which is NDI's domestic uh, observation partner in Sudan, um, both have reported relatively few technical issues related to voter registration. Um, that's not to say that the registration process has been technically perfect. Uh, given the logistics of Sudan, that would be almost impossible to achieve. Um, so it has not been technically perfect. Specific things that have come up is particularly in the south in urban areas. Uh, they've run out of registration materials uh, multiple times, although they do seem to have resupplied them relatively quickly. Um, also, in some centers did not have identifiers, and identifiers were the people who could give oral testimony that uh, confirmed the identity of, that, that someone was actually Southern Sudanese. Um, and I'm told that's a that was a little bit more of a problem in the North than in the South. Um, also, the Carter Center reported in its preliminary statement that the uh, registrants who were rejected were not told of their rights of appeal. Um, also, the distribution of referendum centers was an issue. Uh, in the south, in rural areas, there were complaints of having to walk long distances to register. In the north, um, there was complaints that the registration centers were not all located near southern Sudanese uh, populations. Also, Sundi's data, uh, it's preliminary data at this point, but thus far, Sundi's data shows that the, reg the registration process was suspended multiple times, both in the north and the south, uh, throughout the registration period. In the South, it tended to be things like uh, rain, because sometimes the registration centers are actually outside, uh, officials going to lunch and closing down the center, some officials protesting because they weren't getting paid. Um, and in the North, uh, sorry, and then in the middle of the process in the South, they had the problems of running out of materials. In the North, um, there was the Eid holiday issues that uh, suspended the process multiple times. And because there were so few people registering in the north, particularly toward the end of the process, the reports from our observers, from Sunday observers, that officials got bored and often closed the uh, registration centers early or opened them very late. Despite all of that, uh, all of those issues I just pointed out, it, it appears that both the Carter Center and Sunday will be issuing uh, final statements on the registration process next week. And I anticipate that both will endorse the process as largely well conducted um, and largely a successful registration process. I also understand that the African Union High Implementation Panel on Sudan may be releasing a statement and that if they do, it will have a positive slant on the registration process as well. Um, in general, the issues that have arisen around registration are not necessarily technical issues. There are other issues. Particularly, let's look at first the registration numbers. Uh, so far, there are 2.8 million confirmed registrants in the South. However, that is projected to be 4.4 million when they get all of the information in from the registration centers. Obviously, because of logistics in the South, some of the centers haven't been reporting their numbers on a daily basis. So that is projected to be 4.4 million. The numbers for the North are 115,411 registrants. I believe that is close to a final number, if not a final number. And thus far, the numbers for out-of-country voting, which has, has been extended in certain locations, currently stands at 52,620. Now looking at the number, excuse me, looking at the numbers, um, if the projected number of 4.4 uh, million registrants in the South stay, stands, and that, is, that turns out to be the correct number for registrants, that comes very close to matching the number of uh, registrants for the ele April elections in the South. I believe that was 4.5, 4.6 million. So that, that matches fairly closely. However, the registrants in the North, the Southern Sudan Refer Referendum Commission put out a, as part of their operational plan that they expected 207, or that there, were, there would be 271 1,062 eligible voters uh, or el eligible people, Southerners, to register in Southern Sudan. With the 115,000 number uh, of actual registrants, that means that only 42.6% of the total of eligible registrants have registered in Northern Sudan. Um, and actually, most people think that the 
SSRC's original number was quite low, that there are actually many more Southerners that were eligible to vote in the North than the 271 that the commission anticipated. Um, NCP complained uh, during the process about the very low turnout for registration in the North, and the commission responded by moving some of the registration centers a little bit closer to Southern populations. Um, and that, and then, then they eventually extended the registration period. There was some bitterness about this in the South because they felt the extension was simply to benefit the North and to allow for more registrants in the North and that it wasn't needed overall for the, for the process to be successful. Um, however, ultimately, those protests were, did not get very loud because the extension did not affect the final date. The commission, at the same time they extended, said that no, we will still be voting on January 9th. Um, however, various NCP officials have uh, said that they have indicated that they may not recognize the referendum because of the low turnout uh, in the North because they blame this on, the, on intimidation by the SPLM, who they believe have actively kept people from, the, uh, from registering in the North. From our evidence, while it's certainly true that Southern leaders actively discourage discourage Southerners in the North from registering. Um, both our evidence from our observers and I think from other observers on the ground seems to indicate that there was no systematic um, active intimidation that kept uh, Southerners in the North from registering. And it certainly, there certainly wasn't inside of the registration centers uh, that could be attributed to the low turnout in the North. More likely, there are several reasons uh, for low turnout among Southerners in the North. Um, certainly in the beginning, I think lack of knowledge of where the registration centers were. There was not good uh, voter education and information on that. But also, uh, some Southerners are clearly planning and have been moving south, and so they knew they would not be in Khartoum in January for the vote. There are already, the UN estimates, 50,000 people who have come down from Khartoum since October. Um, and that, that flow continues day by day. Um, and certainly, uh, I think there's a fear, particularly with the Minister of Information statements that were made in Khartoum about Southerners not being, uh, having citizenship rights, not having benefits or jobs if there was secession. Uh, I think there was a fear among Southerners that there, of their names appearing on a list uh, in Khartoum. And there was a fear that the vote could be rigged if they registered in the North, which was a message that Southern leaders um, was, were certainly giving them to discourage them from registering in the North. Um, the NCP filed an official complaint with the Referendum Commission um, saying that registrants of mixed heritage were not being allowed to, reg to register, and there were, there's quite likely some validity to that claim. Uh, in fact, the weakest part of the Referendum Act is the definition of who is eligible, who was eligible to register. Um, it was complicating, complicated and confusing in the law, and the commission did nothing to clarify that prior to registration. Essentially, the decision on who was eligible to vote inside, once you got to the referendum center, was based on a judgment call that was made by the referendum center official. And the manual actually said that it would be based on family name and appearance, that that would help them make the decision and of course the identifiers who were there um, could give oral testimony as to whether or not the person was a southerner or had a connection to the south. Um, however, overall, despite this being a significant weakness of the law and of the commission in terms of the registration process, according to our observers, the scale of the problem appears to be, have been relatively small. Um, according to the Sunday data, there were not large numbers of people who appeared to be eligible um, to vote that were turned away at the registration centers. So it was certainly an issue in some individual cases uh, because of the lack of clarity of the definition of who was eligible, but at least according to the Sunday data, it does not appear to have been an extremely large problem. So that is uh, sort of the registration process up until now. Um, the question is, what are the issues and obstacles going forward, particularly in this month we have left until the referendum? Um, as you could tell from the numbers, the out-of-country uh, voters and Southerners voting in the North will make up a very, very small number 
of the total number of voters in the referendum if the, if the registration number stands as they are today. This will raise confidence in the South that rigging can occur, at least around the numbers. Um, however, conversely, it may lower confidence in the North that rigging couldn't occur. Um, also, the referendum commission remains significantly underfunded. Um, essentially, the Southern Sudan Referendum Bureau, which is based in Juba, um, is out of money. Uh, they, they used most of their recent money to get uh, payments to the referendum officials out in the field to get the registration numbers back. Um, so funding continues to be an issue and has been all along, both for the commission and the bureau in Juba. Um, then there's the issue of delay, uh, which of course is the one that everybody talks about all the time. Um, the, according to media reports, the chairman wrote a letter to President Bashir and to President Keir asking for a two to three week delay. He, ha he would not confirm that he had done this in the, uh, but now I noticed that today he was quoted as saying that he believes a, a one week delay would lead to a better referendum. One reason that there may need to be a technical delay is that the chairman requested to the UN that they reopen bidding for the ballots, uh, for the ballot printing. And so a printer for the ballots was not chosen until Monday, December 6th. Um, that obviously creates a very short time to get the ballots printed. It also, the reopening of the bid, I think we dodged a bullet in a way, the reopening of the bid could have, um, the, the criteria were, when it was reopened, the criteria was lowered so that a Sudanese company, it would be possible for a Sudanese company to win the bid. Um, a Sudanese company did not win the bid. A UK company won the bid eventually on Monday. But that could have opened up a potentially crippling political fight if a Sudanese printer had been chosen because that may have been a line in the sand um, for the South in terms of who would be printing the ballots. But that didn't happen in a UK um, bidder won. As, you, as everyone in this room I'm sure knows, any type of delay is non-negotiable for the SPLM. Uh, January 9th is sacrosanct because they have a great fear that any movement of the date would result in the referendum never being held. Um, currently, it's ex now that we have a printer, it's expected that the ballots will arrive in country on December 26th. The UN has estimated they need two weeks to distribute the ballots, um, and it's exactly 14 days from December tw uh, 26th to January 9th. So there's, there's absolutely no uh, room for any further delay or no room for error, in, even in the shipping process. Um, if the ballots cannot arrive in all of the stations by January 9th, then there's gonna to have to be a tough call to make uh, on the part of the CPA partners and on the part of the commission about whether or not it's better to open up centers and to allow voting to go ahead in some centers that have the ballots, um, but not go ahead in sort of in rural areas where they wouldn't have, the, possibly wouldn't have the ballots uh, by, that, by that time or whether they delay voting. Um, you could look at it both ways. There are issues of credibility and legitimacy in terms of starting the process in some places and not in others, but there's also the potential um, for violent reactions if, there are, if, if voting is started and there's not um, ballots at some locations, particularly in the South, obviously. Um, however, uh, I'm told, at least currently, that the technical advisors for the commission are, are very optimistic at the moment that all of the ballots will be delivered on time. Uh, probably the biggest threat to the referendum process, though, is uh, legal challenge, uh, or legal challenges, I should say. Um, the referendum preparations have not followed the Referendum Act in a number of ways, but the most glaring part is that the finals voter, final voters list was, according to the Act, supposed to be published three months prior to polling, uh, and it's going to be published the day before polling. Also, um, all the materials are supposed to be in polling stations, according to the Act, 72 hours in advance. And that also looks like it will not happen. And there's, there's quite a few other timing issues as well that are not being met in the Act. Um, so there have been announcements by several groups that they will be filing cases, either in the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court, citing the violations of these Acts and asking that the referendum pre preparations be halted. They're asking for an injunction. 
or they will be asking for an injunction. Also, apparently, there's a case that says, according to Machaca's protocol, the referendum should actually be on July 9th and not on January 9th. Um, although the CPA later does say, and the Constitution both say January 9th. Um, the commission chair put out a statement today that said the Constitutional Court didn't have power to review challenges to voter registration, that the Referendum Act uh, says that the signatories of the CPA are the ones that make the conducive environment for uh, the referendum process, and so they're the only ones that uh, can comment on the registration process. And also, it's my understanding that the international community position is that the changes that have happened in the referendum process that are not uh, what was laid out in the Referendum Act can be authorized or legalized by the uh, CPA partners through an agreement um, between the CPA partners. In terms of obstacles immediately after the vote, of course, that's a 60% threshold issue. Um, and the chairman, the, the commission chairman was quoted today in an Arabic language uh, paper in Khartoum as saying, it's unlikely the 60% threshold will be met. I'm assuming at this point he's, and it seemed from the, from the text of the article, maybe he was misquoted on that. But there is the 60% threshold issue. And one issue will be in terms of how the results are announced um, in terms of citizen expectations, because they're counted at the polling station, then they're sent to the, the county level to be aggregated. Those results are posted at the county I'm talking about the Southern Sudan process for the, for the moment. Then it goes to the state, and the aggregate for that state is posted at the state as soon as it's, the counting is done. Then it goes to Juba, and the and the number is posted at Juba. So all this has become public is is becoming public as the process goes along, and so people will be focused on the numbers and not on the threshold issue because the threshold issue can't be determined until it gets to Khartoum to see if 16, 60 percent has been met or not. Um, so there will be a citizen expectation problem in terms of the results announcements, particularly if the 60% threshold is not met for some reason. Um, outside of the referendum process, obviously there remains a lot of concern about the post-referendum negotiations. Um, President Mbeki announced that they, they have been suspended indefinitely, but he did not give a reason, so obviously that's cause for concern because if the agreements were uh, in place, it might be more easy to have a referendum conducted uh, and we might all feel more comfortable about the relationships going into the referendum. Um, on the positive side, there was an agreement, um, I think it was yesterday, in Unity State between the North and South to protect the oil fields. Uh, regardless of the outcome of the referendum and to continue production, which was forced by employees and the companies threaten, threatening to pull out there. But on the other hand, aerial bombardment has continued along the north-south border um, by the Sudan Armed Forces. Um, not clear about which side of the border, um, but that's destabilizing things along the border a bit. And then um, on ABA, I haven't said anything on ABA because there's not a lot to say on ABA. Uh, I saw yesterday the State Department acknowledged that there won't be a vote in ABA on January 9th, and you know certainly that was known but had not been officially acknowledged. Um, the African Union High Implementation Panel has given both sides several formulas, and President Keir and President Bashir have been meeting, but still there's, there's been no movement. Um, tensions do appear to be rising in the area. Um, a group of ABA leaders threatened to block dry season migration of the Miseria, um, although I understand UNMIS is trying hard to address that. Um, and ABA leaders have also talked about holding their own referendum. In response, Miseria le leaders have said that any blockage of the dry season migration will be an act of war, and that they've, and they've now formed their own alternative ABA government. So in closing, I will just go back to my more optimistic beginning. Um, and some people look at me like I have three heads when I say this, but I actually believe the referendum will be held on time or close to on time. Um, I, again, maybe it comes from living in Sudan, but I actually am somewhat optimistic that eventually the vote will be recognized, perhaps not immediately. Um, but uh, I think there's a good chance we'll, we'll get through that sort of obstacle. And then um, finally, I'll say that I think the price is too high for both sides. 
to go back to war. So um, I, there, it's extremely fragile situation, obviously, and uh, anything can happen, but I think there's a reason for at least some optimism on it. So thank you. Thanks very much, Tracy. I'll uh, hand over to uh, Assistant Secretary General. Thanks. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel with uh, Linda and Tracy. Uh, let me uh, begin uh, uh, by first and foremost the voter registration process. And I agree, as Tracy said, that uh, on the whole, the voter registration process was quite good. In fact, the Secretary General's monitoring panel, headed by President uh, Benjamin Mkapa, has also issued a statement uh, basically confirming that uh, the process went well and was free of organized fraud. Uh, I think uh, the numbers which we have got uh, are slightly uh, in the lines of what Tracy was saying. Uh, instead of 2.8 million, we are now close to 4 million uh, insofar as the voter registration in the South is concerned, and which I think uh, is what we had expected. Uh, voter registration uh, in uh, Egypt has not yet ended because, as you would recall, it started a bit late, so therefore more time is being given for voter registration in Egypt, and I believe also for some parts of the U.S. where also the registration centers opened a bit late. Another issue which we should note is that there was no major episode of violence during the entire registration process. There were reports of so-called intimidation from one side or another, but there was no major organized violence which took place during the entire registration process and which I would consider uh, a success of, uh, of course, the Sudanese people, first and foremost, uh, supported, of course, by the international community. From now on, as Tracy again was mentioning, it will be a race against time uh, to ensure that the date of 9th January uh, for holding of the referendum in southern Sudan is actually met. The ballot papers, uh, I think they will arrive a bit earlier than 26th. Uh, uh, the British company which was chosen uh, has promised that they will be able to print and deliver both in Khartoum and Juba and simultaneously to the eight countries where the referendum can be held uh, within a very short time period of 14 days. So therefore, it is likely that the papers might arrive by 22nd or 23rd. Even those three extra days would be quite critical in this current situation. And we have every reason to trust uh, that uh, no delay will be caused uh, to the election date on account of UN's printing of ballot papers or assisting in their delivery. Uh, but uh, we need to worry about security arrangements that would be put in place to protect the ballot boxes uh, and the polling centers and to ensure that the vote counting, the appeal, and the publication processes uh, take place without disruption and without violence. And there, uh, the fact of uh, lack of funding for the South Sudan Referendum Bureau becomes of critical importance because you would recall that the primary agents for providing that security would be the South Sudan police. And South Sudan police, uh, even for simple things like having uh, money for a, uh, for a meal while they are out of uh, their regular stations and away from their families, uh, that money is still not sufficiently available. Abe, which was one of the last areas mentioned by Tracy, remains our major concern. You are well aware that the referendum commission for Abe has not yet been established because the parties have not yet been able to agree on its composition. A number of proposals have been put forward to break the deadlock, uh, including those prepared by the AU high-level implementation panel led by President Mbeki. Uh, but so far, the parties have not been able to agree on a particular formula, be it the referendum, the transfer of ABE to southern Sudan or partition of ABE or any other proposal. Uh, in the meantime, as Tracy was mentioning, and I agree, that the tension is rising in ABE. And the people of ABE do not see progress for the ABE referendum or for the talks between the parties on the future of ABE. What is the United Nations doing? I think uh, UNMIS is doing all it can to support the referendum processes, uh, and of course, UNAMID is also assisting, uh, particularly because you would recall that there are three registration, there are a number of registration centers which are also open in Darfur area uh, for voter registrations. Some of them open late, but then later on, they function quite well. And of course, uh, as mandated by the Security Council, they are uh, 
leading the international support, coordinating the international support uh, to these referendums. UNMIS, uh, particularly with uh, other partners, is providing coordinated technical support to the South Sudan Referendum Commission at all levels, including its headquarters in Khartoum, the operational base uh, in Juba, and uh, the subcommittees in the 10 southern states uh, and the 79 counties. Close to 300 additional international staff are being deployed to assist the Referendum Commission in its activities on the technical side. Second, uh, UNMIS is also providing logistical support, particularly at the county level, by facilitating the transportation of referendum-related materials. This is critical given the lack of basic infrastructure in uh, southern Sudan with many referendum centers uh, located in remote and uh, practically inaccessible areas. UNMIS has also contracted eight additional civilian helicopters for referendum-specific tasks, you know, where the, the movement by road is practically impossible. And these aircrafts uh, are already on the ground. Thirdly, UNMIS is participating in the referendum security committees established by the Referendum Act, consisting of, as I mentioned earlier, the Southern Sudan Police Services uh, and other, both Northern and Southern security agencies. Our uniformed personnel are uh, co-located in the same place with these committees and provide advisory support on referendum security arrangements and policies. And of course, finally, we have uh, also trained the South Sudan uh, Police Services uh, on referendum security. So far, about 16,500 uh, police officers have been so trained in Southern Sudan and about 1,500 in Northern Sudan. So total of about 18,000 trained police officers uh, on security for uh, referendum. But as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we must recall that the primary responsibility for security of referendum belongs uh, to Sudan uh, and is the responsibility of the Sudanese authorities. I mentioned the uh, panel uh, established by the Secretary General headed by former President of Tanzania, Mr. Benjamin Menkapa, uh, to monitor the referendum processes. This is an exception because normally the United Nations does not monitor a referendum or a voting excise that it is supporting logistically and technically. Uh, but uh, to ensure that the referendum is conducted in an orderly fashion and the Sudanese people peacefully accept the results uh, of the outcome, it is extremely important for all of us that the process should be credible and transparent and must accurately and faithfully reflect the aspirations of the population. And that is why this panel is working independently from UNMIS, uh, making periodic visits to Sudan to assess the situation on the ground and to raise key issues and concerns with the parties at a high level and, of course, to advise the Secretary General on the referendum processes and its credibility. And as I just mentioned earlier, it does believe this panel that the registration process has gone off fairly well without or rather free from any organized fraud. Uh, you know that apart from support to referendum, UNMIS uh, also continues its mandated activities for the implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, including border demarcation, monitoring and verification in Abyei, and within the ceasefire zone, and support for the conduct of popular consultations in the South Kordofan state and in the Blue Nile state. Uh, we should not forget these two popular consultations are also an integral part of the CPA. Uh, again, I think uh, while the Sudanese authorities clearly have the primary responsibility to protect its own citizens, but uh, UNMIS has also made uh, a plan to assist uh, in the protection of civilians, uh, both uh, in the pre-referendum phase, in the immediate post-referendum phase, and thereafter, uh, through essentially joint civil-military patrols, through initiatives to foster local level reconciliation and through initiatives to ensure that the mechanisms on both sides for quick information exchange and decision making to prevent uh, an isolated incident becoming a conflagration are actually put in place, well known, practiced and uh, enhanced uh, in their capacities to react. Essentially, UNMIS plan for protection of civilians would also involve 
what I would call decentralization and mainstreaming. Protection of civilians is not a task for military personnel alone. It's not a task for police personnel alone. It's a task for everybody, and it's a task which is to be undertaken not only at the central levels, but at all levels down the chain, uh, uh, so that at, uh, each and every person uh, is committed to ensuring the best which they can uh, in the areas of their deployment. I believe that to ensure a soft landing at the end of the referendum process, which would be quite critical, uh, it is critical to ensure uh, that the parties agree on key post-referendum issues, including wealth sharing, management of debt uh, and assets, uh, citizenship, including for southern Sudanese and northern Sudan and vice versa, and border security arrangements. Uh, we have been providing support to the AU high-level implementation panel in the facilitation of these talks uh, and, of course, stand ready to provide further support, uh, uh, including in the implementation of whatever agreements uh, the two parties may arrive at. Tracy put it very eloquently uh, when she spoke that there is uh, no doomsday scenario uh, in Sudan. And we, too, believe that the security situation in Southern Sudan remains relatively calm, though fragile. Uh, the political and security environment will understandably be tense during and after the referendum period, including for the reasons uh, of announcement of the results at local, at the county, at the, the provincial and at Juba levels. Uh, both UNMIS and the humanitarian community and other UN agencies, I talk for the whole of the UN, have developed joint contingency plans. Consolidated contingency plans for northern and southern Sudan for the period November 2010 to June 2011, so roughly a eight-month period, uh, call for approximately about US dollar 63 million in total for a worst-case scenario. Now, we think that worst-case scenario would not happen. And we will make every effort to make the worst case scenario do not, does not happen. But at the same point of time, it is better to be prepared for the worst case scenario rather than to have much higher costs downstream in a reactive mode. And the worst case scenario, I can share with you, estimates that roughly about 2.8 million people could be internally displaced or displaced uh, to neighboring countries. And roughly about 3.2 million additional people could be affected in some way or other. And uh, this means that a total of about 6 million people could be affected. That's the worst case scenario. Uh, as I said, the parties are committed to making every effort to make sure that this worst case scenario does not happen. We are committed to assisting the parties to make sure that this worst case scenario does not eventuate. But at the same point of time, I do believe it is better to be prepared in advance rather than to be in a reactive mode. So the coming months are likely to be clearly extremely challenging. Uh, for the people of Sudan, first and foremost, and for the international community, which remains uh, very clearly engaged there. The referendum, it's a uh, no-brainer to say that uh, it has the potential to change the future of the country. Uh, and uh, while I think the international community and the CPA parties have emphasized the importance of making unity attractive, which was one of the elements of the CPA during the past five years, they must now respect whatever decision that the Southern Sudanese people adopt. Uh, I was happy that in the 24th September meeting, which was chaired by the Secretary General, this uh, point was uh, made very eloquently and was agreed to by both parties, first and foremost, and of course by the international community. Second, as we move forward, we must keep in mind that the referendum, as momentous as it may appear, is one element of the agreement that ended a very bitter civil war. I already mentioned to you the questions of Abay, the popular consultations in South Kordofan state and in the Blue Nile state. Uh, but you would be aware that that same agreement, the CPA, also paved the way for deepening democratization and development inside whole of Sudan, as well as improved regional stability. And there is every reason for us to continue uh, with the pending tasks of the CPA beyond the referendum and to encourage the parties and the neighboring countries to make sure that uh, the vision which is enshrined in the CPA actually becomes a reality. I do believe that the Sudan 
Sudanese parties, both northern and southern, must recognize that the vision of the new Sudan articulated in the CPA remains as valid today as it was half a decade ago, regardless of the outcome of the referendum. And I do believe that by renewing the trust which they achieved uh, in 2005, the parties can develop productive models of association and cooperation and that doing so will have a seminal and positive impact not only on the situation between North and South, but also on the resolution, hopefully, of the conflict in Darfur. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll pass over to Linda for her comments. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, I think I'll uh, offer a slightly different view, um, the view from the ground, at least as I've had a chance to, to see it in the last several months. Uh, the work that USIP has been doing over the last year has been focused on electoral violence prevention and now most recently referendum violence prevention. And these have been a series of programs in which we've tried to work with uh, mid-level so, uh, civil society actors, um, a, a blend of people who are able then to go back to their home communities and share the information and act as change agents, um, hopefully to prevent violence uh, during these tense processes. Um, so the mix of people we've trained have included police, media, uh, teachers and students, uh, both academic and uh, both higher education and uh, tertiary education, and uh, some clergy, uh, both in the north and the south, uh, a number of NGOs, most typically these are NGOs representing youth and women's groups, uh, and sometimes party officials, and in South Sudan, we ended up having uh, one or two southern Sudanese parliamentarians in our training program. So um, what I propose to, to do is sort of give you a kind of a contrast between uh, the mood and awareness of referendum processes in Juba with the mood and awareness uh, of the referendum processes in Rumbek, where I just most recently returned from. Um, because it is there are many similarities, but there, is, there are some striking differences uh, between uh, the, the center, the capital, and, uh, and the field. And Juba, and as Tracy well knows, Juba is a boom town at the moment. Um, prices are high, traffic is dense, uh, people are active, and it does not appear to be a place where um, there is imminent conflict or unhappiness or tension. In fact, the mood could be described as euphoric. Um, there is a giant countdown clock in one of the main uh, squares and uh, ticking down the days and hours and minutes and seconds. Um, so there, there's definitely a, a mood of anticipation and of quite happy anticipation. And that was reflected by some of our participants who seemed to say to us, I can't believe you think there's going to be violence. Why would there be violence? Uh, we're all so happy about this process. Uh, but that particular mood was also countered by uh, some fear and apprehension by others in the group who said, uh, no, no, we understand that this uh, is, although we're happy about the opportunity that the referendum presents for us, we understand that this is tense, we understand that there are disagreements, and, we are, and we're nervous and anxious about them. Um, so that was definitely the mood in Juba. Uh, in in Rumbek, the, the obvious anticipation for the referendum is far less visible. Rumbek appears not to have evolved at all in the past five years. Uh, none of the roads is paved yet. Um, it's very quiet, almost a sleepy kind of rural place. Uh, it It is almost... Oddly, since it's got, uh, it, since it has a history as the uh, sort of the heartland of the SPLM, it almost seems unaffected by the process. But that said, those who participated in our training program uh, were drawn from throughout Lake State, including heavily from the Rumbeck town area, and they actually were quite well aware of many of the. Um, details of the referendum act and the referendum process. Sometimes better aware on some issues, better aware uh, than the Juba counterparts, which I found quite interesting. Um, they were knowledgeable about, for example, the symbols, the, the joined hand symbol for unity and the single hand symbol for separation. They knew exactly what those symbols were. We, didn't, we just asked and they said, oh yeah, it's gonna be, you know, they knew right away. Uh, in Juba, they didn't know that. Um, they were 
unaware of some of the other details of the Referendum Act, uh, which are included in our presentation. Um, in both Juba and Rumbeck, there was some confusion, justifiably, over exactly what were the qualifications uh, to be allowed to register, especially qualifications for those who are of mixed race, uh, North and South. And we did our best to clarify that conclusion, although given the lack of clarity in the Act itself, I'm not sure how well we did. Um, but there was some concern and some anxiety about um, whether or not Northerners um, would, would be able to somehow um, register in the North and then vote their own way, let's say. Um, there was a little concern about that, but not, I wouldn't say it's an overwhelming concern. I would say that it was a fear they had. There's a fear, to the extent that I could identify a mood of, anti of anxiety, it's anxiety uh, bred from confusion or, or lack of understanding of exactly how the process is supposed to go. Um, there's a real desire to learn more. Uh, there's a real desire to try to counteract their anxiety by um, having a clearer understanding of both the, the internal South Sudan referendum commission process, but also the actions of UNMIS and the international actors and the CPA partners. And they are um, very anxious to get some clarity on the process, um, understandably. We also, uh, kind of part of our programming, in addition to using case studies of previous referenda, such as East Timor, Eritrea, Western Sahara, we also um, talk about the, the skills that um, all Sudanese are going to need in their transformation uh, that their country is going through. And we talk about responsibilities of citizenship and decision making. And in the decision making exercise, which requires that the participants role play um, a, a responsible um, municipal body, which has to take into account the needs of all of its citizens, Muslim and Christian alike. Um, there is quite, that was the most stark difference in terms of the way our program was received between Juba and Rumbek. In Juba, the participants took that obligation extremely seriously, debated for 45 minutes and were unable, wanted more time, wanted more information, were unable to actually come up with a response that they felt really reflected the complexities of the issue. Uh, in Rumbek, it took them five minutes. <laughs> and they came back with uh, you know, a no, which was a no to the needs of the Muslim population. And we, we questioned them, we pushed back on that and, and asked why. Um, and it was interesting because I think that part of that response was simply a lack of experience and unfamiliarity with very complex decision making in a pluralistic society. So in a way it was unfair of us to challenge them that way. Um, but in another way, uh, I think it was good because they actually showed, um, I think, a very promising willingness to, to think about the way we pushed back on that particular exercise uh, and to, to spend some time talking with us afterwards um, you know, thinking and processing and learning about the difference between saying that uh, the South is going to be uh, an accepting, tolerant society, that of course there's a role for all of the Northerners in the South, of course everyone says that. Uh, and then when it push comes to shove and you actually have to make governing choices that uh, put the, that include the rights of the Northern population or the Muslim population in the South, how well are you able to actually do that? And I think the tension between those two things um, was a valuable um, moment for them. And I think that they're responding rather well, uh, despite the, the initial um, impact. Also, there was a difference in the, in the population of our, of our program between um, Juba and Rumbek, because in Rumbek, many of our participants actually had come from the refugee populations and had been educated in Kenya and Uganda. And so we were able to conduct that particular program in English, which is, a rarity for us. Uh, even in southern Sudan, we often have to include a translator uh, and speak um, and have an Arabic translation of our of our programs. Um, but in Rumbek, it was entirely in English with a group of you know 30, 35 participants, and that was interesting. And it actually, I I concluded, could be wrongly, but I concluded that that may partly explain um, their lack of familiarity or their lack of of uh, elasticity with considering the rights of the Muslim population, that they had um, spent too much time outside of the South uh, and had not been familiar with uh, 
with really dealing with Northerners very much. As children, they really hadn't had to deal with Northern Sudanese. Uh, whereas in Juba, there's far more pragmatism. <laughs> you know, the, the Northern population in Juba is very visible, um, very present. Uh, the Juba population is very used to dealing with them and seeing them as part of their community. And therefore, there's a, a very different uh, relationship to them, and uh, I think a, f a far more pragmatic, positive working relationship that, that bears well for the future. So I won't say that there's no chance of retributive violence should there be some kind of tit-for-tat punishment um, against Southerners in the North uh, and Northern, and then it would be uh, some kind of uh, balancing punishment against Northerners in the South. I won't say that that's not possible, but I will say that it doesn't have to happen. It's one of those risks that um, could, could remain a small risk if, uh, if the populations are, again, given proper information and are not um, pushed to do certain things. But there is, there is prejudice uh, present, so there is, there is always that kind of possibility. Um, another interesting thing, uh, since we brought up George Clooney earlier, <laughs> we were talking about uh, the, the, the surge of uh, interest in the United States about the risk of civil war and, and extreme violence, the worst case scenario, as the uh, Assistant Secretary General mentioned. Uh, and, and in fact, interestingly enough, that worst case scenario seems not to have occurred um, to that many people in the South because they were asking us, we're hearing from international media that we're about to go to a really bad war. <laughs> and, and we're nervous, what, is that true? <laughs> so there's an echo chamber, we have to be careful. Uh, you know, they got nervous because we got nervous, and I'm not sure why we got nervous. Um, well, I, I know why we got nervous, but I'm not sure why we were quite so um, vocal about it in main uh, editorial uh, pages, for example. So that news actually trickles all the way back into this sleepy little rural town of Rumbeck, uh, and they were anxious and they want, because we come from Washington, D.C., we must know. <laughs> they asked us, what, well, you know, will the U.N. come in and help us? Will the United States come in and help us? And we said, you know, that's not a question we can answer. Um, and, and, you know, there, there was some, some anxiety um, because the news had made them nervous and made them anxious. We tried to um, at least uh, give them the tools to be able to analyze their own situation with a little more clarity on that. Um, I think that most of the, I, you know, I was going to talk a little bit about what I saw as the triggers and the risks of possible violence, but I think many of those have already been mentioned by my colleagues. Um, so I will, I'll conclude here and look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for all of uh, all of you uh, for the, the great presentations um, and in, in sort of encouraging uh, that uh, by the uh, upbeat uh, assessments uh, by all of you in your your own ways. Um, uh, maybe I can start off with a question and then throw it open to everyone else. Um, it seems, at least in the technical aspects, that uh, things remain stressed, but at, at least on track and 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 uh, have gone relatively well so far. Maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about sort of the political side of things and the political will uh, for the process, particularly from the, the northern side. Reading in the media every day, I mean, uh, depending on your, your point of view, you can uh, sort of uh, read, read within the media signs of impending doom or, or, or sort of plenty of calls for optimism one way or the other. So what's your, what's your take on, on what's happening at the moment? There's obviously a lot of rhetoric and grandstanding from, from both sides. Um, how do we interpret this? That's a pretty difficult question, I, I realize. Um, let's, uh, while you think about your answer, let me uh, throw it out to, uh, to, the, to the people out here and see what other questions we have as well, maybe some easier ones. Gentleman at the back there. Maybe you can uh, introduce yourself as well. Hello, my name is Paul Larson. I'm with L3 MPRI. I would like to look a little bit more in the future beyond the referendum, and can you speak to um, South Sudan's capability of standing up as an independent state. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer Cook with CSIS. I don't want to go too much into the worst case scenario, but I, I, as um, the Assistant Secretary said, we, we do have to be prepared for that. And I wonder if you might speculate a little bit about how the most likely worst case scenario might unfold. Um, what is uh, you, you know where uh, is it is is a small localized situation and then metastasizes uh, is it outright rejection by Khartoum how, just how and where and then how is the how is the UN 
peacekeeping operation kind of pre-positioning uh, for those possibilities. Uh, one more question and then we'll uh, go to our panel. Uh, lady there in the front. Thank you, Zori Samaric with the um, Embassy of Montenegro. Um, um, shortly, um, how uh, you um, uh, plan to address the funding problem? Uh, are you going to help South Sudanese uh, government? Uh, is there any way that international community can come up and help because the violence uh, prevention and uh, uh, free of violence referendum is very important? And follow-up question, how do you see the day after that? Thank you. The day after referendum, the day after referendum, which is important, you mentioned it's citizenship, it's border demarcation, it's wealth sharing. And from the perspective of Montenegro, we uh, can tell you that we have a successful independence without resolving all those questions yet. We have a citizen uh, issue with Serbia still open. We have a border demarcation with Croatia in a very peaceful way, in an intermediate um, level, and some other issues, and we still have a very successful independence. Thank you very much. Let me... Uh, begin first by the question which Richard posed. The political uh, assessment of the situation. And I must say that uh, instead of media, I would take into account the pronouncements which are made by leaders uh, on record in important meetings and of course particularly in meetings where both sides are present together. And the last such meeting was 24th of September uh, in New York, uh, as I told you, organized by the Secretary General, where uh, both sides reiterated their responsibility, which they have reiterated again and again, to hold peaceful referendums, to ensure that there is no violence, uh, to ensure that the referendum is held on 9th of January in a free, fair, and credible manner. Uh, and I see no reason why we should doubt the commitment which was uh, so well articulated, uh, including in a joint communique which was adopted uh, uh, at the United Nations in presence of President Obama and several other heads of state, government, uh, who were represented there. Which uh, links up with uh, the question from Jennifer on, uh, you asked me to speculate in, in some ways twice. One, the reasons for the worst case scenario, and two, how the worst case scenario would actually uh, uh, unfold. And, and both these speculations I am unwilling to conduct. Uh, 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 but uh, because uh, I do believe, but I, I will tell you something else. How will those worst case scenarios be addressed? First and foremost, by effective communication between the two parties and by mechanisms to address any isolated incident that may arise between the two parties. How will it be done? Maybe meetings of the Joint Defense Boards. Let me give you an example of Cote uh, d'Ivoire just now. You know, Cote d'Ivoire is also in a bit of a crisis. But uh, at the same point of time, with our assistance, the four generals, you know, there is a small African force there called LICOM. So its general, the general which is supporting Mr. Alsan Watara, the president-elect, uh, General Bakayoko from the north, General Mangu from the FD's SCI, and our own force commander, uh, who is also a general. So these four generals, we organized a meeting. And all the four generals came and they agreed that option for war is not even an option on the table and that they must remain in regular contact to avoid any isolated incident on part of their respective security agencies. So this is the type of mechanism which I think which needs to be put in place uh, uh, and I think it is being done. Second, I think there is need for better information and communication with the, with the people, with the supporters. So therefore all leaders must refrain from any statement which either uh, makes for what I would call unreasonable expectations on part of their supporters or which incites violence which is inflammatory in nature. This is absolutely essential. Uh, and the people have to be 
told very clearly because uh, uh, there was this question from the distinguished delegate of Montenegro the day after referendum, and I'll come to that in detail. But uh, the day after referendum, no matter what be the outcome, it will still be one country, southern Sudan. We have to remember that there is a transition period of six months till 9th of July 2011. So day after referendum is not going to change much, uh, except that need for to prepare better to deal with whatever the outcome is, uh, whether in favor of unity or in favor of secession. Uh, another thing which we, we must do to address the worst case scenario, as I said, is to be prepared. Because large scale population movements do not take place only on account of war. They take place on account of imminent threat which the people perceive. A robust position of military or peacekeepers on the ground is a mental attitude, not simply a number of military boots on the ground. And insecurity also is a mental perception, not necessarily the insecurity on the ground. I was special representative in Timor for three years, from 2006 to 2009. Before that, in the same country where I've, I've been very closely associated with East Timor, I was the deputy special representative between 2002 to 2005. And you know, there was a tsunami in, uh, uh, which struck uh, many countries, including Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, and so on. So one day, there was a high tide in East Timor. There was a tsunami. But then suddenly, people thought that there was a tsunami. So they all ran to the hills in the middle of the night, I mean, between 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock in the night. We had to use megaphones to try and bring them down. It took, them, took us nearly three days before they came down. There was no tsunami, but nearly eight people got fractures or uh, broken bones uh, in this mass uh, exodus which took place towards the hills. So we need to explain very clearly to the people that they should not be insecure, but at the same point of time, we have to deal with their feeling of insecurity, which, as Linda says, does not exist, luckily now, in, in Rumbek and Juba, but may exist in other parts uh, uh, of Sudan uh, and also in the neighboring countries. Uh, on uh, the funding problem, I think the international community, I must say, that we are very grateful to the international community. Before the funding was provided for by the government of Sudan and by the government of Southern Sudan. Uh, there was no funding for the referendum at all. And a basket fund was created by the United Nations. And in this basket fund, many countries, including, of course, United States, contributed very generously. The first country to contribute and to fully disburse its contribution was Japan. Uh, and this basket fund actually helped in uh, taking the process forward. There are many countries which are still contributing, for example, the United States, the European Union, through assistance in kind, not, not through cash, through assistance in kind. Uh, but then, uh, again, uh, some more assistance uh, would be required, and we, I think the first and foremost, we should call on the government of southern Sudan to make sure that the required amount uh, of uh, Sudanese pounds uh, is made available for their own police uh, in uh, on the day of the referendum and to, to make sure that uh, these uh, challenges can be overcome. At the same point of time, whatever we can do within our difficult economic crisis, I realize very well that uh, the world is facing a financial crisis, but whatever we can do uh, uh, to assist them would, of course, be beneficial. There was a very critical question, and I want to, I took some time before coming to it, uh, that was, Southern Sudan's capability as an independent state. And this was a question which, uh, since I have been very intimately associated with Timor Leste, I have answered on many occasions. The attributes of a state, capability is not one of those attributes. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, because we don't say that a state cannot exist because it is capable or not capable. Secondly, I don't want to dis decide uh, uh, or be in the seat which decides uh, which is a state which is capable and how exactly does it become capable because there will be different uh, uh, answers which we would arrive at. What do we need to do? We need to strengthen the capacity of southern Sudan, whether it remains part of Sudan or whether it becomes independent. We still want to enhance its capacity for administration, for governance, for rule of law, improvements in the justice sector, improvement in the correctional system, better policing. These are the Kantian aspects of the state, you know, the, the duty. Uh, 
But then there are Weberian aspects of a state where also we need to help them. Better creation of better infrastructure, better health facilities, better education, uh, uh, better utilization of oil wealth. Uh, in fact, actually, all that I'm saying is absolutely comparable to uh, Timor Leste, which is also an oil and gas producing country the, and which became independent from Indonesia. Uh, the good part is that the Southern Sudanese themselves are aware of these requirements. They themselves have priorities. They made approximately 18 priorities, which were discussed uh, in uh, a meeting jointly organized by the United Nations and World Bank in Brussels uh, in the middle of October. And we are making plans to see how the United Nations, acting as uh, a representative of all of you, the international community, can be of assistance to them for a period of two, three, or a few more years uh, beyond 9th of July 2011. Uh, that has not been the topic of discussion today, but that, is, that in itself is a very big discussion. Uh, what beyond, not 9 January, but what beyond 9 July? Uh, and. Uh, that, of course, deals with Southern Sudan, but I made a reference. We need to continue our efforts to ensure that there is peace in Darfur and to ensure that uh, there is uh, the, uh, what I would call enhanced participation in decision making, a feeling of inclusiveness on part of all the people, whether from Northern Sudan or from Southern Sudan, which is the only guarantee for uh, peace and security and for regional stability. So, I hope I have answered all the questions, of course, except for the speculation on the worst case scenario, which I would leave. Please. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the, to the last um, answer. Uh, beyond the capacity issue, the workforce capacity and other issues, um, the, one of the main challenges in southern Sudan will be citizens' expectations. And if you uh, look at the um, report, that is outside, you'll see that it's very clear that Southern Sudanese have extremely high expectations for what an independent Southern Sudan would look like. They expect to be just like Uganda or Kenya in 10 years. Um, and when I told that to a government of Southern Sudan official, all they could do was shake their head because it's, it's not realizable for the most part. Um, also, there are significant issues, um, and this all comes from citizens' views. Uh, it's, not, it's not our NDI personal opinion, but citizen views um, in terms of concerns about corruption, concerns about tribalism, um, and the issue, a specific issue that the government of Southern Sudan will have to deal with is that citizens in our study were very strongly against sharing any, continuing to share any oil revenue in an, uh, if they become independent. Uh, and so that's not politically or economically feasible, um, but one of the reasons they have such high expectations for development is they believe they will all of a sudden, after independence, be getting 100% of the oil revenues, and therefore they'll have schools and roads and hospitals uh, and uh, sort of a boom in development. So from the citizen aspect, I think the government of Southern Sudan has a number of challenges as well. Uh, I just want to address the, um, the, the capacity question and the, the what to make of the rhetoric question. <laughs> I think that uh, it can be disconcerting for the international community that um, Sudanese negotiators have brought brinksmanship to the highest art form. And um, I, I think that in some senses that's, that's just something we have to get used to, but also that we shouldn't assume that these conversations are happening where uh, the momentum towards war is in the ascendant. In fact, uh, in the last six years, the, mom the momentum of, of peace has, has actually got a certain amount of weight to it, and it will actually have to be pushed against the momentum of peace in order to start a war. That's certainly not saying that war is not possible, uh, under certain conditions even probable, but I think that there is, um, of course, an interest amongst uh, both sides not to engage in serious hostilities, organized serious hostilities. Um, and I think that we just have to, you know, look on the bright side, the glass is half full. And uh, that doesn't make it, you know, easy, but it means that uh, we should assume that these uh, negotiators really do have the best interests of their communities at heart and there should be a way for them to, you know, at the last possible moment, uh, come up with something that makes sense for them. Um, of course, we need to 
we need to be prepared. Of course we need to not be caught scrambling. I completely agree with that as well. Uh, the future uh, of South Sudan, uh, its capacity, for me, yes, many of the issues that I see as major challenges have been mentioned. I would also add the challenge of the migration, the return. Uh, all of these people, thousands and thousands of returnees who are, you know, will be welcomed, I'm sure, in many ways, but also will be a challenge on very limited resources, uh, very limited capacity to, to deal with them and to offer them any kind of services. Uh, and, and these challenges, I think, are not the, they're not going to be the indicator about whether South Sudan can succeed as a state. The indicator will be how they're dealt with. All states have very serious challenges, some of them more serious than these. And um, the, real, the real indicator of the success of the South will become clearer and clearer as uh, it is forced to deal on its own, although with support for sure, uh, with very, very significant challenges, and above all, uh, I think to resist what will be an inevitable impulse to, to close in and to, to hide certain decisions that it's making. That's a very natural impulse when faced with severe challenges to not, not be clear about some of the difficult choices you're making. Um, we have that problem <laughs> in this country when we make difficult choices. Um, un you know, fortunately for us, we have a very rigorous uh, set of institutions that make it possible for us to find out what's going on. Um, but there will be a very serious, uh, I think, uh, temptation to, to uh, close down and to, to not be transparent. And that transparency, that lack of transparency, will trigger um, lack of trust will trigger all of the other issues, tribalism and fear in, in South-South competition. And, and so that's, that's the risk. Um, but I believe that there's a great deal of possibility that um, the will and the, the capacity of the leaders of the South uh, make success as a state quite possible. Thank you. Let's take a, another a couple of questions. Uh, gen gentleman at the front there. Oh, just wait for the microphone to come your way. Thank you. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. Um, I have been told that one of the real challenges now in the Sudan is the plethora of NGOs working to try to promote the election and the absolute lack of effective coordination. There's a couple of groups there that it gets to fighting over who's going to get the SUV. All of the permanent places have been taken, so then you have to set up your temporary places and so on. Uh, I know that we always make a big argument in economics that uh, sometimes you just have to let the f market forces operate, and beyond that, you know, you're going to see what results and so on with some changes. What is the coordinate? How many NGOs are there now in Sudan, and what is their coordination as we get closer and closer to the election? And the real question is, is it effective coordination, or is it a lot of duplication going on? Thank you. Uh, Keith Jennings with the National Democratic Institute. Uh, Richard, you started out by saying that this would be important to Africa, uh, regardless of the outcome. And I'd like to pose a question to the panelists. Uh, what role do you see for the, the surrounding states? Are, are they uh, playing any particular role right now? I know Ethiopia is hosting the IBA uh, discussion, but are they getting more concerned or less concerned? Uh, could you? Please uh, speak to that. Let's take uh, one more. How about from this side, the lady at the front there. Thank you so much for your remarks. They were very informative. Uh, my name is Abigail Long. I'm with Humanity United. And I just have a kind of general off-topic question as to what you think the impact of the referendum will be on the Darfur region. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the NGO question, though I'm not sure I have probably uh, good information for you in some ways. Um, I guess, it, one, it depends on if you're talking about international or domestic NGOs. Um, certainly, there are many, many international NGOs. I don't know the number. Um, I know that in the NGO forum, of which we're a member, there are over 100 members. So, um, however, the number working on democracy and governance and referendum-related issues is not that large. Um, we work with uh, UNIRED, which is the UNDP. Um, we have coordinated on civic, civic and voter education efforts. 
Um, within the USAID funded partners, we're sharing uh, materials that we've developed. Um, so the same types of materials are getting out in terms of voter across the board in terms of voter uh, information. So I would say that overall the, um, the coordination has been quite good among the small number that work specifically on the referendum uh, type issues in terms of, um, you know, we have weekly meetings with UNIRED and also with uh, IFAS, who is another technical advisor on the commission. Um, there have been some with domestic NGOs, there have been some complaints about um, how many are included in the, the voter information uh, process. I don't know if that will be changed this time around as we lead up to polling. Um, so there have been some of those issues, but overall I think coordination has been fairly good. Okay, uh, let me uh, also add my bit to the NGO question before I go on to others. I think there is a there is an additional challenge, not so much with NGOs related with election, but with NGOs who are doing very good work in the field of humanitarian assistance, development of children, uh, promoting health, uh, and there I find two challenges. In fact, I don't find the challenge so much of uh, many NGOs, I find the challenge of rather a lack of NGO capability, uh, particularly because if there is a feeling of insecurity, then many NGOs might want to reduce their presence uh, just prior to the referendum. Uh, and that would be the time when they would actually be most needed to help the people, the migrants, as Linda was saying, who are trying to come back, uh, or other population movements which take place. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I'll be quite frank, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, UN humanitarian agencies uh, are working with the Council of Churches in Southern Sudan. And uh, I was more worried about the absorptive and delivery capacity of those churches because everybody says that they are working with the Council of Churches. So the WHO, the UNICEF, the, everybody has found one answer, Council of Churches. So it's not only a question of uh, multiplicity of NGOs, but also rather a lack of NGOs, particularly on the socio-economic side of the equation, on the humanitarian side. On role of surrounding states, I think the surrounding states and indeed the African Union are concerned this would be an event of momentous importance for, for Africa as a whole, no matter how the decision of the southern Sudanese people goes. Uh, and uh, uh, they are also concerned, particularly the neighbors, uh, about uh, the challenges which they might have to face if they encounter some population movements across the borders into their own areas. You know that uh, uh, Egypt is already hosting a large number of Sudanese as migrants. Uh, uh, then I'm coming down, uh, then we have Eritrea, we have Ethiopia, which, is, which of course has played a major role. Ethiopia is also a guarantor of the, the CPA. Uh, and President Meles, I must say, is, uh, is playing a very critical role, apart from hosting the other uh, stocks on a bay. Uh, then we come down, we have uh, Kenya, the border, well, uh, the Kenya border is comparatively small, but then we have a comparatively long border with DRC, which, uh, really speaking, the uh, DRC government is trying its best, but it faces a challenge of what I would call extension of legitimate state authority in the north and in the eastern parts of its own country. Then we have the Central African Republic, which would be a major border, but Central African Republic will face its own challenges, particularly because it would be in electoral mode. You know, the next election, uh, the presidential election in Central African Republic would be held on 28th of January. So that country would also be in an electoral mode at the time when the referendum is held and the referendum results are announced. Then we come to Chad, which will also be in an electoral mode at the same point of time. So the, there are challenges, but I think uh, some countries, particularly Chad, uh, which does not have a border with Southern Sudan, it has a border basically with Darfur, uh, but it has got now for the last few months nearly half a year, a very good mechanism with the government of Sudan to have joint border patrols. It has come to a good understanding with the government of Sudan, and I think that has decreased rebel activity on both sides of the border. Uh, so yes, the surrounding states are concerned. They will have Uganda, yes, of course, sorry, I forgot, but Uganda uh, is, uh, I mean, in a slightly different category from the countries which I mentioned, and Uganda is, uh, it will also play an important role. Uh, uh, particularly through Uganda and Ethiopia and Egypt uh, will also play very important roles through the provision of troops to the UN operations. You know, already the troops from these countries are playing a very, very critical role uh, in Darfur as also in Sudan. 
impact of referendum on Darfur, uh, more than the impact of referendum, I think uh, the challenge is that uh, would the government of Sudan be in a position to make meaningful concessions which will uh, provide for uh, uh, better participation in decision making by the Darfurians uh, before the referendum? Uh, the answer to that, I think, is somewhat unclear at this stage. Uh, similarly, would the movements, and they, there, is a, there is a bigger challenge there, uh, would uh, SLA Abdul Wahid and JEM negotiate meaningfully and constructively, which the international community has called upon them on numerous occasions to do. Uh, but that also I find uh, a bit challenging. Uh, I think it's unlikely, and that is why it certainly worries me. I just hope that whatever be the outcome of the referendum, these rebel movements come to the negotiating table at the earliest possible, so that a comprehensive, inclusive agreement on Darfur can become a reality. I'll take on the Darfur question, perhaps against my better judgment. Uh, uh, I think that there's a potential for the impact of the referendum on Darfur um, I actually, from my perspective, I read it the other way around, the impact of Darfur on the outcome of the referendum, uh, or rather in the post-referendum period. Assuming that there is a vote for independence and that there is the formation of an independent South, I think that um, there is a, a strong possibility of either a best case scenario or a worst case scenario. The best case scenario is that the new Southern government can play an honest broker role if it has managed to come out of the referendum and separation process uh, with a good working relationship with the North, then it can, in fact, um, through vacating its position as a partner in the government of national unity, perhaps leave open some possibility um, for the Darfurians to have a power-sharing arrangement of their own. Uh, that is something that will, there's a lot of ducks that have to be put in a row before that outcome is going to be possible. Uh, on the other hand, a newly independent South that has an acrimonious working relationship with its northern neighbor um, could be seen as um, a, a focal point for Darfurian rebel movements to look for support. Um, that's a natural uh, incentive for them, and that I, I believe that the assumption is that that's going to happen regardless of whether it has or will. Uh, and then, then you have a worst case scenario because the North will, in fact, see the South as a target uh, legitimately if it's harboring Darfurian rebels who have not come to the table and started a peace negotiation. Um, so there, there's, there are a lot of moving parts to that analysis, um, but I see it as not all bad news uh, for the resolution of the Darfurian conflict, assuming that um, the quite high barriers um, to to a strong southern role uh, are met in the next six months to a year. Thanks very much. I'm afraid we're uh, pretty much out of time now, so we'll have to end the questions there. But I just want to give our panelists maybe just a chance to, for a quick uh, couple of sentences each uh, to, to finish us off. Um, I'm going to encourage you to sort of gaze into your crystal balls now. And, and uh, two questions. Are we going to have a referendum on January the 9th? And will it be a referendum which accurately reflects the, the will of the, the, the voters who take part in it? There you go. Who wants to go first? Tracy. I think I gave away my answer to that already. Um, but yes and yes. Um, I'm, I am, uh, again, it's an extremely fragile situation. Uh, and anything could happen. But I think, uh, I think there's reasons to be optimistic. I think the momentum um, that has been built it will be hard to stop, um, and I think if it's not January 9th, it will be quite close to January the 9th. Um, and there will be many bumps um, in the next month, and there will be bumps after the vote, but again, I think we will ultimately get there where the vote will be recognized. Well, let me give you the, the same answer, but in slightly different words, which is that we, the Sudanese parties, first and foremost, the international community and the United Nations representing the international community, we must do everything which is possible to make sure that the answer to those two questions is yes. Uh, so right now, I don't speculate whether the answer will be yes or no, but the point is that we must continue working as if, through our work, the answer would really become yes. Thank you. 
Uh, I also say yes, uh, although again with the qualification that if it's not on January 9th, it will be shortly after, um, hopefully for the reason that uh, the, it's recognized that the process is as important as the event itself, because the outcome needs to be seen to be accurate and free and fair. Uh, and I think that there's an awareness, a growing awareness that that is in fact the case. I think that at this stage there are just too many people for whom the referendum is a, a critical matter for it to not occur, uh, and to not occur very close, if not on January 9th. Um, and I do uh, agree with Tracy that um, that it will be probably uh, um, almost inevitable that, that uh, a result will be recognized, if not right away, at least sometime after. Uh, and I do think that the international community is uh, is there helping, and uh, I think that that's uh, one of the many reasons for, for some optimism. Well, thanks very much to, to all of you. Um, we're making our own preparations for the referendum here at uh, CSIS. We've just started this week a, a, pre a page on referendum preparations on our uh, website, on the uh, CSIS Africa program site. We'll uh, have audio of events uh, around the referendum, commentaries, and uh, other uh, audio bits and pieces as well. So uh, I've written down the address to tell you here. It's uh, cs.is forward slash Sudan dash referendum. But uh, I'm sure you've remembered that. And uh, <laughs> please uh, look it up for when you get back. Well, look, I'd like to thank all, our, all three of our panelists, Linda Bishai, Atul Kare, Tracy Cook, for taking time out uh, in such a busy period to come and join us today. And uh, please join uh, me in uh, thanking them for their time this morning. Thanks.